Well, as Elise already said, I too am a, I'm glad you're here today. Um, it's going to be a good day. This is, this is one of my favorite of the sermons that I will preach out of Ephesians over the next several weeks leading up to Easter. And by the way, Easter's coming. We're going to be talking more about that. We, we're going to need some, some plastic eggs. We're going to need some candy. We're going to need all that kind of stuff. We'll tell you in detail next week all that's going to be going on during our Easter weekend, but it's going to be a big deal. So, so start ramping up. Start, start saving your plastic eggs. Uh, but as I preach from now till Easter uh, through the book of Ephesians, today is probably my favorite of the sermons. Today is probably also potentially the most painful of the sermons because it just hits us right where we live. And, and, and where we live is right between this, this, this sense of, 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 of chaos and hostility on the one hand and the, the, the release of tension and community on the other side. And, and we live our lives somewhere right in between that. Uh, relationally and culturally and, and, and politically on an international level, it seems like we as human beings live somewhere between like... like the, the house is on fire relationally and, you know, singing kumbaya together and, and having, a, having a, a sweet party. And so there, there's that tension in life. And so, so that's what we're talking about today and that's what makes today poignant but also maybe a, a bit difficult. If, if it's difficult for you to listen to, understand that it is for me as well. That it is for me as well. Um, I want to start by telling you something about the Caulfield house. Lydia and I and our five kids uh, one of our children, one of our five children, is known as the peacemaker in our home. And uh, every one of my five kids has his or her own special gifts. Uh, every one of the five has his or her, her own special place of honor in our home. Uh, but Nolan, our 14-year-old, he's running the computer day. Uh, Nolan, uh, about to finish 8th grade, he is our little peacemaker. He's not little anymore, but he's, he's always been the peacemaker in our home. And uh, he regularly reconciles differences uh, between two people, sometimes more than two. In our home... Um, and in his school, with his friends, uh, he's, he's always fulfilled that role. He's always been the reconciler. His preschool teacher, uh, this would have been 10 years ago, his preschool uh, teacher once told us, when we asked her, how's the year been? How's the year gone? Uh, she said, it has been a hard year but Nolan is my little ray of sunshine. Uh, even, in, even, even as a little guy, uh, even as just a little kid, he was a, he was a peacemaker. And he has what the Bible would call the gift or the ministry of reconciliation. That's what the Apostle Paul calls this ministry. The ministry of reconciliation. Now what you need to know is, and we'll see this here in a little bit, Paul says that every one of us, as Christ followers, have been given the ministry of reconciliation. If you are a follower of Jesus, Paul says, you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Now, reconciliation, being a peacemaker... Reconciliation is not a word that we use um, real often. I, I do, but, but maybe, maybe you don't. And so I thought it would be good, uh, I looked up just the simplest definition of the word. Reconciliation, it means this, the restoring of friendly relationships. I love that. So if you have the, the ministry of reconciliation, then you have a ministry which involves restoring friendly relations. There used to be, or maybe there never was, friendly relations 
There's animosity, there's hostility, there is division, there is strife, and you come along, you don't light a match, you come along, you don't pour gasoline on the fire, you come along and you work towards restoring friendly relations. Repeatedly, Paul speaks in the book of Ephesians, I think we have this, of a mystery. He speaks of a mystery <clears throat> hidden by God for the ages. He speaks of it in, in Ephesians, several places. He speaks of it in the book of Colossians, a ministry hidden for the ages. He says a ministry of God hidden by, or a ministry hidden by God for the ages but now revealed in Christ. And we've talked about this. We talked about week one when I was giving you an overview of Ephesians. We talked about it on Wednesday night. Uh, we've talked about it several times on Wednesday night. But, but if you're new or maybe you missed it or you just need to hear it again, what is this mystery the Apostle Paul speaks of? Let's look at these scripture passages. In Colossians 1, the mystery hidden for the ages, for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Okay, but that doesn't tell us what it is. Paul is saying there's been this mystery. This gospel mystery. For ages it's been veiled and now it's rolled out in, in, in full color. The next passage is Ephesians. Oh, this is just a, this is just a, yeah, I'm no, sorry. Ephesians from the NLT and from the ESV. This mystery is that, that, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. Members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And then the NLT says, and this is God's secret plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body. Both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. I believe the second one is the NLT. Yeah, the second one is the NLT. The first is the ESV. Uh, no, nonetheless, there's this mystery. And it's relevant. This isn't the passage we're actually studying today, but this is relevant to the passage that we're studying today. Uh, there's this mystery. And the mystery that has now been revealed is this. The church. Every one of us. And all the non-Jews spread throughout all the churches around the globe. Us. We now are recipients of the same promise that, that was once thought to be reserved only for the nation of Israel. We've been welcomed into the family. We've been invited to the table of God. We have been adopted. Um, you don't have to be Jewish. Uh, you, 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 can, you, can, you can now rest in the fact that, that there's a place at the table of God for you. That's the mystery that Paul speaks of in Colossians. That's the mystery that Paul speaks of in Ephesians. And that is, uh, you may not fully realize this until we unpack it, but that is exceedingly good news for us all. It has implications much beyond just the color of your skin. Maybe you don't live in a day and an age where you feel like, well, uh, I'm a non-Jew. I didn't think I was welcome in the church but now I know that I am. Maybe you don't struggle with that, but this passage has so many implications that are so relevant to all the different ways in which maybe you feel unwelcome or less than in the church today. Let me remind you that this is, this letter, Ephesians, is what we refer to as a prison letter, meaning that, that Paul had a lot of time on his hands. Uh, he was in prison. He wrote several letters. Um, he wrote Ephesians and he wrote a Colossians, both of the passages that we looked at today. And, and I, I'm comforted in, in the, uh, the fact that there is much similarity between these two letters. He's in prison. He's writing these two letters. And he's, he has a burning passion within him. And it's, it, it creates a similarity in Ephesians and in Colossians. Let's now read today's passage. I'll, I'll read it out loud and you follow along silently. Ephesians chapter 2 beginning with verse 11 it says this. 
Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, you were called the uncircumcision, uh, by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, uh, having no hope without God in the world, but now, but now in Christ, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances that he might create in him one new man in the place of two. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the, Christ, through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers, you are no longer aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Now, there are a lot of words there. There are a lot of words in that passage. And that is a, it, it is a, I, I suppose we could call it a complex or complicated passage. I don't expect that you caught every word there today. I would have to admit as a, as a pastor and as a person who's done a lot of schooling, uh, I don't totally capture every, the essence of every aspect of what Paul is saying. It's just too rich. It's just too deep. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try though. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try to understand this with all that is in us. So I'm not going to attempt today to, to, to unpack for you every nuance that is in this passage because it would, it would take hours and hours and hours and we still wouldn't accomplish that. But if I may go hard after one central theme. I believe this to be the central theme. And that is the issue of conflict and how Christ has come to tear down the walls of hostility that divide us. Now remember, as I've said, Paul knows conflict. Paul is in prison. Maybe you've been incarcerated in the past and you know that there is a great deal of animosity and a great deal of conflict in the whole culture, in, in the whole backdrop of incarceration. And Paul knows that. He's writing these letters and he's got probably people around him shouting obscenities and, and fights going on and he's trying to focus and the Holy Spirit is leading him as he's writing this letter to the Ephesians. Now if you go back and you read Acts 19 and 20 and 21, I, I believe those three chapters, you can read about the history of the birth of the church in Ephesus. But here's how that goes. There was no church and then Paul came along and there were several Gentile, non-Jewish um, converts and now we have a church. A church of people that don't know much of anything except that Christ has, has, has saved them and the Holy Spirit has filled them and, and now they're eager to learn. And so Paul, I can't imagine, I can't imagine being away for any length of time and just worried about those, those poor, those poor pitiful brand new Christians that I, I need to teach them more. Well this letter is to them. 
And it has a context. It has a context. A time period and a history and a, and a back story. Uh, these are real people that he's writing to. Gentiles living in a real world of hatred and division and animosity. What divided human beings back then, do you suppose? And, and I think the answer could easily be probably the same things that divide us to this day. The context is different, but the human spirit is the same. The, the backdrop is, the different, is different, but, but, but human nature is the same. So perhaps there was not much difference between what separated them and what separates us. And a, 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 an incomplete, a non-exhaustive list might be this. Uh, perhaps race, perhaps culture, uh, ritual, um, perhaps a contextual misunderstanding. That would have divided them in that day as it divides us, even within the church, to this day. You're my people. I'm preaching to you, the church. I'm not preaching to the entire community that surrounds us. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing the word to you. And, and, and these are the things that, that have the potential to divide us as well. Yeah. As a, as a, a white, um, middle class outdoorsmen, there are things that you assume about me without asking me or without checking in. And, and those are the types of uh, contextual understandings and misunderstandings that tend to divide us as they tended to divide them back then. Yeah. I'm, some things in this manuscript today, I'm like, I don't know if I want to say that. I'm going to go ahead and say it. Uh, so I'm going to try. I'm just going to stick to the manuscript because that's better than, I've, I've learned long ago, it's better than preaching off the cuff because then I regret th saying things I haven't thought about saying. So I'm just going to stick to stick to what's on the page here because uh, this is kind of a hard topic. But, but so, so contextual misunderstandings. Right or wrong, good or bad, truth or false, you, many of you, um, would, would assume, based on contextual understandings, misunderstandings, that, that I'm, uh, that I uh, wasn't born here, that I, um, that I like country music, and that, and, and because I'm, because, you would you would assume that I voted for Trump. You would you would assume those things about me because of contextual understandings and misunderstandings. And, um, contextual misunderstandings. How, how my uh, like I guess relatives uh, might have winced judgmentally at uh, rap music or hip-hop culture or somehow, uh, somehow assigning uh, morality to that, uh, somehow as though that was a less, lesser culture. Maybe you do that. Maybe I've done that some. We have these contextual and cultural misunderstandings that, that are often born out of misinformation or ignorance. This happens all the time. We don't understand someone's perspective or culture or context and therefore we, we criticize it. So remember, uh, this is Paul, prison letter to, the, to, the, to, to Ephesus. He had visited Ephesus. He planted a church there decades ago and a large number of Gentiles had turned from a cultural practice of pantheism. That means worshiping many gods. They had turned from a, a cultural practice of pantheism um, and they had claimed Jesus as their sovereign leader. And if you go back and read, read in the book of Acts, <clears throat> you'll read that 
<clears throat> that the rest of the city uh, in Ephesus thought that this, this small group of Christians, they thought they were nuts. And, and, and these Christians had brought a, a load, like a truckload of their books, um, their books on uh, pagan worship, and their books on, uh, on uh, uh, witchcraft and spells and incantations. And they brought them together in a good old fashioned, uh, for a good old fashioned book burning. Uh, and and uh, we know that it, it was many, many thousands of of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars worth of books that were burned. And the town, the town was confused in Ephesus and they asked, they asked, why all this waste of money? And the, uh, they were told, this group of, we call them Christians, uh, they believe that a man named Jesus is the Son of God. And they believed that, that though he was crucified, uh, he has returned from the dead and they have resolved to follow his teachings. And the rest of Ephesus, the whole town would have said, how stupid. What a waste of human ingenuity. And so the Ephesian Christians were living in a time of cultural chaos and division. And into that, into that strife, Paul writes this letter. And he speaks of, uh, of God's power. The phrase that we've read several times over the last four weeks is, is God's immeasurable power in the lives of those who believe. And one of the results of that, the key result of that is our salvation. That we are we go from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive. But the second result of that is that, that now we have the restoration of relationships. The restoration of friendly relationships. The word is reconciliation. Of all kinds. Of all kinds. We're going to see that in some other passages today. But when Paul speaks of reconciliation, he is not only speaking of reconciliation between the Gentiles and the Jews. He's speaking, yes, of racial and ethnic reconciliation, but he's also speaking of socioeconomic and political and cultural reconciliation. Christ has torn down the walls of strife that have in the past divided us. Even us in this room. Ephesians 2, we, we've read it, but now we're going to start picking, the, picking this passage apart. 14, we already read this, but now we're going to look verse by verse. For he himself is our peace, who made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing walls of hostility, the walls that divide us. And Paul would say, Every one of us in this room, every person that walks this globe who claims to be a Christ follower is now charged with the ministry of reconciliation. This comes out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and it says this, all this is from God, the same author, Paul is writing this, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled to himself, us to himself and gave us what? The ministry of reconciliation. You were charged with that. In fact, in my family, uh, it's not that only one of, my, uh, ch one of my children is charged with the responsibility of reconciliation. We all are charged with the ministry of reconciliation. If you are going to follow Christ Jesus, you are obligated to be a minister of reconciliation. If you are not working in this world toward reconciliation, then you are working against it. So the gospel story, what Jesus did on the cross, the gospel story means that alienation and, and separation, 
become reconciliation, become unity. Now, now think on this. Lest we make this a trivial matter, think on this. Hostility? Boy, we live in a hostile world today, don't we? Hostility? Um, separation? We, we live in a, a really, really multi-tiered world, don't we? Even just, just talking about our own country. Like different people live with different, with different narratives, totally, totally unreconciled, totally, totally separated. Those types of hurdles toward relationship, this hostility and this separation that I speak of, those are such enormous hurdles. I mean, do you ever feel like this is never going to work? People are never going to get along. Whatever the, whatever the, the, the hostile, the hostile uh, topic you think of, like you, no one can ever reconcile this. Right? And the reason that we feel that is because these are enormous hurdles. The, the walls of hostility that divide us, they are enormous, seemingly insurmountable hurdles. And that, <clears throat> and what it is specifically that has, that has broken down those walls. Let me ask that in the form of a question. What is it specifically that has broken down those walls of hostility according to this passage? And the answer isn't to just God, although that's true. The answer isn't just the Holy Spirit, or although that's true. But, but what specifically in this passage has broken down the walls of hostility? And the answer comes out of verse 13. The answer is the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 13 says that. But now in Christ, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We, we read that when we read the whole passage earlier. Now we're, now we're picking it apart. Such an insurmountable hurdle. Like the, the hostility and the separation and the animosity and the division that human beings have known for generations throughout our history, Paul says such, such a high hurdle, such an insurmountable hurdle, the only thing that can tear down such a wall of hostility is the blood of Jesus Christ. The point is, Jesus Christ did not only go to the cross to forgive your sins, to pay the, the penalty for your sins, and to, to get you out of hell. He, he also went to, the, his blood was shed so that animosity might be replaced with reconciliation. We tend to believe that on a vertical level. We tend not to be convinced of that on a horizontal level. The blood of Christ, such high hurdles as racism... Hatred, class warfare, cultural misunderstandings, animosity of all, all these issues that divide us can be cleared only by something as great, only by something as powerful as the blood of, as the blood of Christ. It explains why there are tensions and divisions that have lasted for thousands of years. Because they have not been dismantled by the blood of Christ. So here is what Christ's shed blood has now accomplished for us. We are now reconciled on a vertical level to God, yes, but we are also now reconciled on a horizontal level to one another. If you ever think of someone else, this is never going to work out. I am never going to be able to get along with this person. We will never be reconciled. You can be, you will be, through the blood of Christ. So reconciliation, the breaking down of walls. It's not a secondary issue. 
You cannot as a Christian go through life saying, I'm good with, I'm good with God, I'm good with Jesus, I'm, I'm not good with my neighbor, and it's just going to have to remain that way. You cannot go through life like that. And not, not in claiming to be a believer. Horizontal reconciliation is not a secondary issue. And if I, if I don't speak about the walls of hostility that separate us in the church, I become, I become complicit myself. I become guilty of the sin myself. If Christ has charged Christians with the, the ministry of reconciliation and we are still busy causing strife, then, then we too are guilty. Let me say that again. If Christ has charged Christians with the ministry of reconciliation and we are still busy causing strife, then we are guilty. So I'm going to ask you a question that I've, I've, we've been asking around our house lately of one another, just, just, just yesterday. and It was really uncomfortable. Nobody liked the question and I didn't either, but... but the question is this, um, if, if, God, if God says that, 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 that we were once his enemy, but now we are welcome at his table, we've sung that, right? That we were once, once an enemy, now welcome at the table of God. We as men on Wednesday nights have just been celebrating that. That we're, we're now part of the family of God. So here's the question. If, if that's true, then, then who isn't welcome at your table? Don't, don't answer out loud and... Don't nudge your friend or your spouse. Just um, think on that. Who, who isn't welcome at your table? Now, now before we, before we, because uh, it's, it's easy for me to get, get real um, self-righteous on that question. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. It's easy for me to get real self-righteous and say, well, like, like, Mean people and, and intolerant people and uh, closed minded people, they're not welcome at my table, right? Like, and that makes me look good because that means I'm not mean and I'm, I'm tolerant and I'm all, all that. Uh, but if we could just give one another permission, because this is a silent exercise anyway, um, to, to, to go a little deeper, to be a bit more introspective. Like, who isn't welcome at, at your table? Um, what we're really talking about is having collectively and individually a spirit of humility as opposed to a spirit of arrogance. So I, I've been doing some personal evalu uh, evaluation or introspective thinking myself. I've gotten down off my high horse and I've, I've started thinking, who isn't welcome at my table? It, maybe you're my age or are older and maybe you're super judgmental of, of millennials. You know, as though we weren't 20-something at, at some point in, in our lives, right? We were never 20-something. <laughs> but those darn millennials... Who, who isn't welcome at your table? Young people, are boomers welcome at your table? What, what about race? How do you feel about, about me? I mean, you, 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 I know, you love me. But, but as a white guy, as a white guy... <laughs> As a, as a white guy, do you feel as though maybe I'm the cause of some of your problems? Do you assume that I'm, I'm arrogant or I'm always a, 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 like I go first kind of a guy because I'm, I'm white? And if you're white, how do you feel about Hispanic people? Who isn't welcome at your table? It, 
If you're a, if you're a Republican, is, is someone who thinks that uh, President Trump is a bully or a, a borderline fascist and dangerous to our country and all that, you know, is that person welcome at your table? If you're a Democrat, if someone who's, who spent eight years um, saying that President Obama wasn't born here or he, or he uh, secretly was a Muslim and just didn't want to tell anybody, then, is that person welcome at your table? If, if you're rich, are you uncomfortable around poor people? If you're, if you're poor, do you hate rich people? Do you envy rich people? Envy and, and strife and, and hatred and division. Paul says Jesus' blood was shed for that. This idea of tearing down the walls of hostility that divide us, it's not a small matter. It's a Jesus matter. It is a gospel-centered matter. Jesus came to tear down the walls of hostility. Racially, culturally, contextually, ritually. And in doing so, Paul says, he made one new man in the place of two. We could say one unified people in the place of, of many. Verse 15 says that. says that Jesus' blood was shed that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And then I believe we have Romans 12 next. It says this, that so we, though many, are now one body in Christ. So we can't, we can't just read this passage and say, oh, this is just about Jews and Gentiles, and that's a thing of the past. We don't have to deal with that now. No, it's relevant to us today. He takes the many, and he makes us one in Christ. Individually members one of another. And what I think that means is when you, what I think that means is that when you walk through the door, you don't have to check out, you don't, you don't have to, to, to check your individuality at the door. I don't think that's what it means. I mean, I think it's saying it quite the opposite. You're an individual with your own convictions and your own context and your own backstory, you know, uh, your, 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 your own. I mean, maybe you are hip-hop, or maybe you are a boomer, or maybe you, you do love country music, or maybe you are white, or maybe you are poor, or maybe you are rich, and, and we are those things. They make us who we are. And we, don't, we don't have to check those at the door. We don't have to slink around and hide, right? We don't have to go on Tuesday and be like, well, I'm going to get in this line, but I hope I don't see anybody because they, you know, they might judge me because I'm on this side, you know, or I'm voting on the primaries on this side, and I'm going to hide because I don't anybody see me. We don't have to check our individual, individuality at the door. What we have to do is we have to realize that, that though individuals, we are members one of another. We are one body in Christ. Last verse we're going to look at is 19. So, so, so then you are no longer strangers. You're no longer aliens. You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household. Just briefly, what does Paul say has been accomplished here? 
Here is what is now changed in our no longer being separated. Here's what is now changed in our no longer being divided. Number one, we're no longer strangers. Uh, number two, we're no longer aliens. And the closest, contextually, the closest word would be uh, in that, taking the context of that day, it would be uh, foreigners. We're no longer strangers. We're no longer foreigners, the body of Christ. And then two things that, that are positively accomplished. We are fellow citizens with the saints, and we are members of the same household of God. We're family. So four things that, were, that have been accomplished. Two, negative two, uh, two in the negative form, two in the positive form. No longer strangers, no longer foreigners, but now rather we are fellow citizens and we are members of the same house. When you're members of the same house, you got to work it out. Ain't nobody leaving, ain't nobody going nowhere, so we got to work this out. So in closing, um, I got five application statements. I'm just going to read them. Maybe you think they're awesome. Maybe you think they're a bit trite. But, but this is what I have. In light of everything that we've said. In light of everything that, I, that, 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 that Paul has said. I encourage you in five ways. Number, number one. Number one, I encourage you. Welcome newcomers to River Church every week. Talk to the people you don't know. Number one. Number two. <coughs> invite people who aren't like you to come to church with you. I don't know who you invite to church. I don't know if you invite anybody to church. But invite people who aren't like you. Number three. Celebrate when elements of worship represent a context or a people who are unfamiliar to you. We might call that diversity in worship. Celebrate that. Number four, strive, determine to love diversity more in the future than you do now. That's such a charged word. I, I realize that. But I, I trust that you know my heart. I trust that you know what I mean by that. A diverse group of people loving each other over the long haul. Strive to love diversity more in the future than you do now. And, and my last charge, my last, my last charge is this. Consider how you might fulfill the ministry of reconciliation to which God has called you. How might that look in coming days? Amen. So be it. Let's pray.